I searched my house top to bottom looking for my reading glasses. I was so frustrated. My favorite pair of reading glasses, I couldn't find them. I'm looking around, checking everything, 10 minutes worth. My wife is sitting there watching me run through the house looking for my glasses. Finally, in exasperation, I grabbed my head and said, my goodness, what are they? And my glasses were on my head. Distraction in this natural world is why so many people never reach their goals. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Let me start by saying this morning how grateful I was, first of all, for Ed. Ed wanted to email to the congregation the time of my sister's funeral for yesterday. And I shot him an email and said, Ed, I don't think that's necessary. It's just a funeral. I don't think people need to come out to a, a funeral. And Ed corrected me and said, well, pastor, you're our pastor and you're our brother. And so we believe we should be there to support you. And when I read that, I shrugged my shoulders and said, okay, whatever. And I thought not much of it. And yesterday when I saw some of the members here at the funeral, I actually realized how much of a blessing it was uh, to have brothers and sisters that I know that I'm familiar with with me in my moment of grief. So thank you all for the ones who came out. I appreciate it so much. Uh, secondly, uh, we, we all know about the situation in Ukraine. I'm sure most of us are following it on the news. And, uh, a lot of cause for concern in the world right now, a lot going on here. And uh, if I could give a piece of practical advice to us as a church, it would be that uh, if you can, you should store up maybe 30 to 45 days worth of food, dry goods specifically, just in case things get out of control, because this can, this can reel out of control, realistically. And I think that we should be wise and uh, prepare for what may occur. In the meantime, uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance has a fund for Ukraine, for our missions in Ukraine. We actually have churches in Ukraine who are trying to serve the poor, and the hungry, and the orphans. There are many, many orphans. There's also a lot of people with disabilities, special needs, who can't, who can't escape. It's a very tragic situation. And so let's pray for them. And if we can, let's support uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance as they seek to support our churches that are in the region. Our text today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And it reads like this. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one born, as to one abnormally born. And that is the word of the Lord. Professional golfer, a time, Tom Kite said this, that you can always find a distraction if you're looking for one. You can always find a distraction if you're looking for one. Sitting at home and I wanted a bowl of cereal and I didn't have any milk. I got dressed, I went to the store to get me a gallon of milk so I could have some cereal. And when I got home, began to unpack my bag, I had pistachio nuts, I had doughnuts, I had Sprite, and I had rice. I didn't have any milk. <laughs> I went to my sister's house to drop off a snowblower. I got there and she was standing in the door and we started talking. I went inside, we had coffee and we laughed and talked and reminisced about so many different things. I jumped in my car and I was headed back home. I looked in my rearview mirror and saw that my trunk was still open and the snowblower was still in my trunk. <laughs> I searched my house top to bottom looking for my reading glasses. I was so frustrated. My favorite pair of reading glasses, I couldn't find them. I'm looking around, checking everything, 10 minutes worth. My wife is sitting there watching me run through the house looking for my glasses. Finally, in exasperation, I grabbed my head and said, my goodness, what are they? And my glasses were on my head. Distraction in this natural world is why so many people never reach their goals. And distraction in this walk of faith leads to spiritual dead ends, stunted spiritual growth, and could even lead to the forfeiture of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Distraction. In this book of 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle has been correcting the church on multiple fronts. He's been identifying their weaknesses, answering their questions, identifying their flaws and their sins. They were a divided church. I keep mentioning that because that is the context in which the book was written. They were a divided church. They had differing positions on everything, it appears, from eating at pagan temples to women in ministry to spiritual gifts, and the list just goes on and on. While to some degree, 
Each of their points of contention had some merit, had some relevance. Really, most of the things they were arguing about, most of the things they were so concerned about, the things that were dividing their church were of secondary import. They didn't matter nearly as much as they believed. They were majoring on the minors. They were lost in the quagmire of opinion and biblical propositions. They were unaware that as they fought, as they dissented and divided, that they were losing spiritual ground, distracted. Beware, brothers and sisters, the danger of spiritual distraction. Beware of the human propensity to mistake the subplot for the main idea. Beware that you do not mistake the snapshot for the big picture or some principled hill as Mount Zion herself. There are so many principled hills that we can fight on, so many principled hills that we could die on today. Principled hills including topics like cultural morality, social justice, political philosophies, theological skirmishes on matters like total immersion and baptism, end times prophecy, cessationism, all of such secondary import. Beware of the distractions that may seek to thwart your spiritual elevation and chain you to this temporary world that will soon pass away. We should train ourselves at all times to keep first things first so that we don't lose sight of what the gospel of Jesus Christ essentially consists of. Anybody here who's been saved more than a year will chime up at this point and say, Calvin, Pastor, I already know what the gospel consists of. I've read the Apostles' Creed. I understand what it is that we believe, the bedrock, the foundation of the church. I already understand that. I know the formula of the faith. But you know what? So did the people at the Church of Corinth. It wasn't that they didn't know the formula of the gospel that was causing them to fall so far behind spiritually. They knew the gospel. The problem was with them as it is with much of the church here in the 21st century, that they had allowed themselves to be more overwhelmed by the implications of the gospel than they were with the gospel itself. They were more concerned about the implications of the gospel than they were about the gospel itself. What are the implications of the gospel as it pertains to women speaking in church? What is the implication of the gospel on spiritual giftedness? What are the spiritual implications of the gospel as it relates to how to interact with pagans in the world? They were concerned about the peripheries, the implications of the gospel. None of those are bad questions. None of those are bad things to think about. But when the answer to the question becomes an official position, when the answer to the question becomes a litmus test as to who is in and who is not in the kingdom of God or who is spiritually superior and who is less worthy, it is then that we have supplanted the main message of the gospel of Jesus Christ with a counterfeit religious system that caters more to our taste and our spiritual conditioning than it serves the purpose of Jesus Christ. In much of the past 14 chapters that we reviewed together, Paul has been responding to many of these side issues. He's been trying to recover the church at Corinth from the ditch of dissension and to re-steer the church back onto the blacktop that leads to eternal life. They're off track. Jesus warned us of this. Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. And why is that? Because the gate that leads to eternal life with Jesus Christ is very, very narrow. And for that reason, many people, I dare say most people, and even many people who think they have found the right path, have actually veered far off the main road and are headed for catastrophe, distracted. Because faith in the implications of the gospel does not save. Belief in the peripheral philosophies that may be derived from scripture do not have any power to save. And so Paul, like a good apostle, like a good pastor, Paul has been entertaining the church's immature ponderings very graciously, very patiently, very respectfully. But now it's Paul's turn to speak. Paul comes full circle from the earlier chapters of 1 Corinthians, and he represents to the church the main idea, the big picture. First things first, he says to them now, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now, now that we've gotten through your litany of questions, now that I've been gracious enough to entertain and to answer the questions that you thought were important, now, I remind you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which I preach to you. You've told me about what you think. 
You've given me all of your opinions. You've asked for my advice about many things. Now that that's over, let me remind you of the gospel that I preached. I didn't preach to you about women in ministry. I didn't preach to you about speaking in tongues. Let me remind you now. Let's regain our focus. Let's stop being so distracted now, brothers and sisters. Let me remind you of the gospel that I preached <laughs> to you. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's revisit your first love. Let's rehearse the ultimate truth that drew you to the faith in the very beginning, before you even knew what theology was, before you were baptized into this cultural Christianity. Now, brothers and sisters, let me remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. The simple gospel. The gospel unadorned with intellectual or cultural or philosophical trinkets. Let me remind you of the original message that beat back the darkness and gave you an opportunity to see the light, the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ that invited you into the kingdom of God before you had any religious positions. The gospel, Paul says, that you also received the raw and unnuanced gospel that you accepted so wholeheartedly at the very beginning before you got so smart before you became so nuanced, before you became so well-versed in religion. You can remember that, right? When you first came to Jesus, how simple it all seemed, how uncomplicated it all seemed. You accepted the simple, basic message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. So why has it become so complicated now? One will say to me, Calvin, you know, there's so much going on in the world. We need to, we need to understand how the gospel speaks to these problems. We have to know the answers to these questions. Another person will say to me, well, you know, I didn't have kids when I got saved. That was a different world. Now I have children. I have to understand the implications of the gospel as to how to raise my children now. Another person will talk to me about how bad the culture has become and how we as a church need to take our stand on certain principles and condemn this world. How we need to act and train ourselves to see the world in a countercultural manner. There's a fight going on, Calvin. We must understand the implications of the gospel. You know, you know, I, I cannot completely describe this, but there is something very appealing. There is something very alluring about this concept of becoming cultural warriors for Christ. There's something very exciting and appealing about that. Something very exhilarating about being a part of what is billed as a kingdom embassy dueling against the philosophies of this dying world. There's something very appealing about that. It gives a person a sense of purpose. An exciting uplift that fends against the ordinary and the mundane. Because for too many believers, the gospel of Jesus Christ all by itself is just too basic. It's too simple. It doesn't provide enough personal fulfillment and satisfaction. And so we leave off the main idea and we start chasing after peripheral matters. Because the gospel doesn't seem to satisfy. It seems to some to be a bit too basic. But that may well be because the gospel is not about them. The gospel doesn't feed the ego. The gospel doesn't look to bring out the best in any individual, but instead the gospel's mission is to deliver a person from his own flesh, from her own ego. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls an individual to deny himself, to deny herself, and to humbly, quietly, and obediently follow Jesus Christ all the way to the cross. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to become insignificant and lowly challenges us to opt out of the pleasures of this world, challenges us to walk away from the honor and the privilege of being right. And the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us to live in a loving coexistence with all people. Wow, really? Well, Calvin, not only does that sound very mundane, that does not sound very desirable, and it sounds rather counterintuitive. That's the gospel? That's the gospel. It doesn't seem to make any sense. For Jesus Christ to invite me to be on his football team, to give me my helmet and my pads, to send me out on the field and say to me, now Calvin, when they throw the ball to you, just keep your arms down. Let it hit you in the chest and bounce off. Don't even try to catch it. Don't even try to run. Don't even try to win. That sounds so counterintuitive. Calvin, when the enemy has the ball, let him run past you and make the touchdown. Don't even try to fight back. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. Brothers and sisters, that's the gospel. Jesus went out onto the field of life and took the field and got and took a knee and allowed the opposition to run him over. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not very exciting. That's not very thrilling. That's not very desirable, especially to my flesh. But that's the gospel now that Paul the apostle wants to remind them of. 
that there is no offensive strategy in the kingdom. There is no defensive plan in the kingdom. Just stand there on the field and allow yourself to lose. Who wants to be a part of a team like that? So what the Corinthian, Corinthian church did is very similar to what we do today. We go out and we find ourselves some cause. We go out and we find ourselves some position to fight for. We make war with the world in order to distract ourselves from having to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a distraction. We live our Christian lives chasing and being chased. That makes us feel alive. That makes us feel relevant. But it's not spiritual life that you're feeling. It is the life of the ego who refuses to die and who you do not have the courage to crucify. Paul here wants to remind the church of the gospel that he preached to them. The gospel he says that they received. Then he says, this is the gospel in which you now stand. One of the really cool definitions here of stand right there is to pitch one's tent. Paul is saying, this is the gospel I preached to you in which you have now pitched your tent, made your stand. This is the original gospel where you found your home, where you planted your flag. Remember that? The gospel. This is the gospel by which you have been saved, he says. Your thoughts on the issues of the day do not save you. Your understanding of the Trinity doesn't even save you. Your church attendance doesn't save you. Your positions on social justice will not save you. If you are saved, you are saved because you heard the gospel and you received the gospel by faith. And this is the gospel in which you now stand. If you hold firmly to the word which I preach, if, that's a big if, if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you. It seems to me here that Paul has some reservations, at least about some of the people in the Corinthian church. He says, if you hold firm to the word which I preach to you, unless, unless you have believed in vain. <laughs> to hold firmly here means to continually believe and to practice. If you continue, continually believe and practice the word which I preach to you, then this gospel will save you if you continually believe and practice the word which I preach to you. That's a big if. Paul knows that's a big if. Looking at their list of questions, he knows that something is off here. So he wants them to understand that if they do not believe and practice the gospel that he preached, then they may very well have believed in vain. In other words, their faith might not even be real. And listen, it is not enough for them just to believe the gospel that he preached. But true believers believe and practice the gospel. What comes to mind then when I say that? True believers must not only believe but also practice. What comes to mind? Of course, the first thing that comes to mind is to live a moral life, to live a life of morality. But in a moment, Paul is going to teach us just what true morality really looks like to the believer. He's about to reintroduce us to the gospel. He says to them, for I handed down to you as of first importance. <laughs> I like the way he says that. We've talked about everything under the sun that you think is important, but now I want to talk to you about the thing that is of first, primary importance. What I also received. Living a moral lifestyle is certainly important, but it is not of first importance. I need to say that again, probably. Living a moral lifestyle is important, but it is not of first importance. But if you get the first principle correct, the moral lifestyle will automatically follow. All of the peripheral topics that I mentioned before, social justice, morality and culture, political philosophy, all of these peripheral topics, topics I mentioned are important to a degree, but none of them are of first importance. Paul says to us that what is of first importance? What every child of God must not only believe but also practice is this that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Of first importance, before John Calvin and Martin Luther and predestination, of first importance is that Christ died for our sins. He didn't die from a heart attack and he didn't die from a vehicle accident. Christ died because people killed him. And as they killed Jesus, as they nailed him to the cross, he did not try to defend himself. He did not fight back and he did not resist. Now, when you read this in the context of what Paul has been talking about, the fighting and the skirmishes and the arguments going on in the church, Paul says to them, what is of first importance for you is that Jesus Christ willingly died. He calls you and I to willingly die. You want an implication for the gospel? That's the implication for the gospel, that you willingly die. 
The implication is that the gospel calls each of us to go out onto the battlefield, onto the football field, and take a knee as our opponents run full steam ahead toward us to die. He calls us to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he calls us to practice crucifying our own flesh. And he calls us to practice as well, allowing other people to persecute us without making a sound. This is the gospel. When I hear people talking about religious freedoms in America, always think about Jesus. What would Jesus do if he were here right now and they were trying to snuff out the church? Would he go up to Capitol Hill and talk to the congressman to ensure his rights? Or would Jesus just take the loss and keep on moving? He would willingly die. That doesn't sound very exciting at all. That, that hurts the ego quite a bit. I want to put up a fight for what's mine. You know who did that? You know who did that? Very interesting. Paul the Apostle did that. When you read the book of Acts, Paul the Apostle did it twice. Paul the Apostle was about to be stoned uh, by, by the Jews. And Paul stood, no, no, I'm a Jew. You can't do this. I'm a Jew. I have rights. You can't do this to me. On another occasion, they were getting ready to stone Paul and Paul's way. I'm a Roman citizen. I have rights. I have political rights here. I have immunity from this. He tried to do that twice. Didn't work either time. Trying to defend himself. As Paul grew older, you get to the book of Philippians, Paul realized by then, he said, you know, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm a Benjamite. According to the law, I'm blameless. I count all of that but nothing. He had realized, you know what, I'm, I'm fighting, a, this is the kingdom fight. This is not a political fight. This is not a cultural fight. This is a kingdom fight. What country I belong to doesn't even matter. I don't need the protection of any government. I am governed by Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit right now. I don't need to be protected by men. The gospel of Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ does not need to be protected by any government institution. We are the government. The Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulders. If the church at Corinth had been practicing this, there would have been no divisions among them. There would have been far fewer questions, far, far much less divisiveness and animosity, but no one was willing to die. No one was willing to abandon their rights. They were not practicing the gospel that they said they believed. They believed Jesus did it. They believed Jesus died. Yes, Jesus died for our sins. And while they had impeccable positions and opinions about why one should or should not eat at pagan temples, while they were staunch in their beliefs that speaking in tongues was the superior gift, they never made the connection or it never seemed to occur to them that the way that they could move forward together as one body was for each of them to deny himself, to tear down their walls of defensiveness and allow the other to have the right of way. They never made the spiritual connection between Christ's submission to death and his call for us to follow him to the cross. They never made that connection. They could make the connection on many issues, but they couldn't make the connection. When they read what Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, they never made the connection. And this is why they were getting into fights and skirmishes with the world today. That's why we get into fights and skirmishes with this world today, because we do not realize that the way Christ saved the world was not through words, was not through politics, was not through religious resourcefulness, but through death. Paul reminds them that they are to believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And they are to practice doing the same. He also reminds them to believe that Jesus Christ was buried, that he was moved out of the way, out of sight, hidden from sight of mankind in a tomb. And once he was buried, the world kept on turning without him for three days. He was deemed insignificant and of limited usefulness to the world. And Jesus did not protest. He was taken out of the way. They deemed him insignificant and he did not open his mouth. But, but the church at Corinth, each one of them sought significance. They wanted to be important, whether through their spiritual gift or through their money or through their status. Many of them wanted to be seen and to be known. Many of them wanted to be perceived in some special, unique kind of way. That is not practicing the gospel. Jesus Christ was buried, deemed insignificant and moved out of the way, hidden behind a stone. And the Corinthian church must believe this. And then they must practice, listen to this, they must practice that same insignificance. You wonder why people don't follow Jesus, like, because this doesn't sound very happy. They must learn to be insignificant, to be treated with insignificance, and to accept it. That is what it means to practice the gospel. Doesn't sound very appealing, and it's not very appealing. 
That's why they were distracting themselves with all of these arguments and questions because they did not want to face the obligation to follow Jesus Christ all the way to the cross. They didn't want to be still and accept the implications of the gospel for their own lives. They would much prefer to spend their time occupied with considering the wrongs of others to fill up their souls with righteous indignation toward the wretched sinners in the world than to practice the way of insignificance as demonstrated by the burial of Jesus Christ. But all is not lost. The story of the gospel is not a hopeless story. Paul says you ought to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You ought to believe that Jesus Christ was buried in a tomb. Then you ought to believe that Jesus Christ was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. He suffered, he bled, he died, he was considered insignificant, but on the third day, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, physically and bodily, as the most significant, the most unique, and the most worthy person to have ever lived in the world. This is what they first believed. This is what Paul the Apostle is now calling them to practice, to practice dying to themselves, to practice being insignificant in the world, and to wait in hope for their resurrection just as Jesus Christ waited three days for his own. This is the way. And then finally, they're called to believe that Jesus Christ was vindicated. And by implication, that means so will they be vindicated in that day. Paul the Apostle says that Jesus Christ appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until this day, but some have fallen asleep. Then he says, Jesus Christ appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. Jesus Christ was vindicated. His vindication was not done in a corner. His resurrection was witnessed by over 500 people. Jesus was vindicated. And his pattern for living in this world has proven to be true. Paul is calling the church at Corinth, and Paul is calling all of us to remembrance, to understand how the death, the burial, resurrection, and vindication of Jesus Christ should inform all of our lives, should shape all of our faith until we see the model of perfect existence face to face, Jesus Christ our Lord, this is what we believe. And as we wait and hope, we humble ourselves. We walk in the way of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are so many distractions in the world today. The biggest distraction, of course, is social media. Time-consuming devil takes all of your energy. But there are other distractions. Human beings are masters at distracting ourselves from our responsibilities to follow the call of Jesus Christ to the cross. Paul the Apostle here is calling the Corinthian church to stop being so distracted. He began this book telling them that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. But I'm going to put a pin right there for a moment and answer all of your peripheral questions. But at the end, I'm coming right back around to tell you the same thing. This is the gospel that I preach to you. With all of your questions answered, now it's time for me to remind you that none of it even matters if you don't get first things first. When I was in the Army, I had a friend. I guess he was a friend. I played a prank on him. I took his mattress and hid it behind his locker, and I made his bed up with just the springs. I made his bed up and put his pillow there and everything. It looked like he was real comfortable. He came in and jumped on the bed. Boom! Oh! oh. Beautiful made-up bed with no mattress. Too many believers today are beautiful made-up beds with no mattress. We do not have the foundation of the gospel correct. and We have busied ourselves with peripheral matters. Things that, while they are important, are not of first importance. I tell you today that if you get first important, the first things first, if you view the, the things that are important as being firstly important, what is important to Christ is what is important to you, everything else will fall into place. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's keep first things first. Let's not be like the Corinthian church and go chasing every rabbit hole and every new topic that comes out in the fad of the day. Let's hold first things first and practice the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will find resurrection hope and power when you do this. You'll find victory in living the Christian life. And God will be glorified all the more through your life. The challenge that we have, it's a challenge that I have, that we have as people. It's just difficult to believe that if I surrender, I'm going to win. That just doesn't seem to make sense. I know, I feel it. That if I don't fight back, I'm going to lose. I, I'm still going to win even if I don't fight back. That doesn't seem to make sense. It seems illogical. 
If I were Jesus, I could see myself in the Garden of Gethsemane, pacing back and forth and saying, God, wouldn't it be better if you just let me live? Then I can teach people about how to be good. I can teach people how to glorify you. I could be a perfect example. And it, it doesn't make sense that I would have to die. It's the paradox of Christianity. That's the paradox of our faith, that when we surrender, when we let go, then God gives us all things. That is faith. Next week, we're going to talk about that, what the resurrection means. <laughs> But the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the implication of the resurrection of Jesus Christ for you and for me. But that's next week. Let's pray. Father God, we love your word and we love this gospel that you have given to us to deliver us from our sins, from our flesh, from our own egos, from our own agendas. Too often, Father God, we take matters into our own hands. And in our foolish desire to win the victory for your kingdom, we begin to operate in our flesh to try to counter the assaults and the ons onslaughts of this world. Too many of us, Father God, have lost confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we think that salvation is by our own might or by our own power. Forgive us for that mistake. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Give us the strength, the faith, the courage, and the hope to believe that as we let down our defenses, as we trust completely and wholly in you alone, that you will be our defender, our redeemer, and our vindicator, just as you were and are for your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen.